What's going on YouTube? So last video I made, I just checked my spark plugs and kind of all the basics. The bike's still really hard to cold start. So we're gonna dive into a valve set and at least check the valve lash. Kind of sucks, I already had the bike all torn down to check the spark plugs, but it is what it is. It's relatively easy to get to that stage once you know kind of the steps to take. And I'll run you through basically what I did and what I'm gonna do to check the valves on this 2012 Yamaha R1. First, take the seat off quick. It just has two bolts. Those are the seat hole bolts. They're Allen keys, five mil. The trim sitting on your tank has one Phillips screw. And then the whole thing slides towards the front. Pop those off both sides. And then the tank, so you have one Allen key there, one in the center, and then the same on the other side. And then the whole tank flips up. Now you've got the tank flipped up. I use my little toolkit. If the tank's not full of fuel, this works really well on its own just to support the tank. And then you take out your Phillips screws all the way around. If you're just doing your air filter, you don't have to touch the fuel line coming in or the wiring harness. But if you're going deeper to check your spark plugs, just pop this fuel line off. The orange tab pops straight up and squeeze each side and the line will pull off the, the fuel rail. If the tank is full of fuel, like I just put fresh fuel in this to see if that was my running issue. I just have a little bungee kind of go into the seat bracket just to give it a little extra support. So if you guys are doing a compression test, I was hoping that the bike would crank with the fuel switch here kind of in the kill position but it doesn't crank so i had to rig it up just with the fuel line connected and i had everything else disconnected I had the whole air box out and then just straight to the spark plugs and then fuel on and it'll crank it'll build fuel pressure and you will still be injecting fuel into the cylinder so you don't want to i mean keep cranking it more than necessary but it does get the job done so air box lid comes off pretty easy, air filter stays in there. The lower half of the air box looks intimidating, but it's pretty easy too. So all you need is a 5 mil Allen key that's a little bit longer than your traditional one. I think this is four and a half inches or so. And these intake trumpets are connected to the little plastic rail here. And they just pop right off. No clips or anything, just gently pull them. And then your Allen keys here along the bottom row and two in the center here and here and then the whole air box just pops off moving over to the bike side it is a little bit tight but there's where the coil on plug setup would be so of course my coils and my plugs are out right now so to get the valve cover off we're gonna have to take these throttle bodies out to test compression properly, it would be a good idea to take these throttle bodies right off before testing. Uh, it's nice to do it in the wide open throttle position, but because this is drive by wire, I don't want to throw out any of the position sensors or the throttle body calibration. I'm not sure if it would throw off the calibration if you pin these wide open manually, like if you propped them open by hand but it's not worth the risk for me. I uh, just want to keep it as simple as possible. I don't like going to the dealer if I don't have to or spending more money than I have to. So keep it simple. Take the throttle bodies right off if you're doing a compression test. 
So a couple of connectors and all your sensors, uh, 10 mil to loosen up the throttle cables here. So there's two of them. And then four mil. Four mil Allen key kind of come in the side here. And you can see the throttle body clamps right there. So we got these two through the side fairing. And then on the other side, you can get the outer one through the side fairing. This inner one, I actually had enough room just to go between, between the fuel rail and the throttle body there. So now this whole thing should be loose and should come right out. All right, rail just popped out. There's one connector on the bottom there. Kind of went below the throttle bodies. Right there. And then the two throttle body wires. The black one goes up top there. You can get that one out with the throttle bodies in. And then the silver one there, kind of just wiggle it out as you're taking the throttle bodies out. And just a tip with these throttle bodies, I had one of these little caps actually fall off on the ground and I didn't know what it was from. They're not really held on by much, just a little small clip and they fall off really easy. And if something like that happens, you will have a vacuum leak. So just something to keep in mind, make sure all your little caps are on. So now with the throttle body's out of the way, we can get a good look at the valves. They all look really clean. I think I could do a leak down test as well, but we're already here. I'm gonna be checking them regardless. Now one of the main things with the job like this is just trying to keep everything clean. So I put some rags in the throttle bodies there and I had a vacuum kind of sucked out any of the loose stuff. And I had some compressed air in around the spark plugs, just clean, the cleaner the better. So now if we get this harness out of the way here, Feel this little heat cover back. There is our valve cover. So got a lot more real estate here now that we got the fairings off. So the fairings are pretty basic. They're all just the same five and four mil Allen key. And just take out the little ram air piece, the big side fairing, and now you can see the rad cap and everything which is a nice spot for it because when the bike's on the kickstand and not an actual stand that holds it level, this is the highest spot. So when you're filling up the coolant after, just take it off a stand if you have it on a stand and use the leg, the kickstand, and it should bleed pretty easy. So now our valve cover, it's actually not looking as bad as I thought it was gonna be. We're gonna pop this cover off so we can have access to the crank and spin it over by hand. So this is just part of the PCV that was running up to the airbox here. So that whole thing just pops off and one connector there and we're at the valve cover. Crazy tight fit, but got the valve cover off. Nothing really fancy. I'm going to try and reuse this gasket. So you got one position sensor there. It can just stay in the valve cover. When you're taking the valve cover out, it's a really tight fit with the frame. I never touch the coolant or the rad or anything. So it's all in there. I know a lot of guys say you have to take the rads out or loosen them and tilt them forward. I did not and I just squeaked it out. The secret to loosen your wiring harness, it kind of goes to your ECM and your modules up front here. Loosen this wiring harness and just wiggle it 
kind of up and away from your valve cover because that's kind of what blocks you. And then shimmy the whole valve cover back and then the, the tail end to your clutch side, clutch side of the bike. Tilt that side out first and it will come. It's tight, it takes some persuasion, but it is doable. I think it is worth a little bit of a struggle just wiggling it out so that you don't have to touch the cooling system. You don't have to drain, fill, make a mess and bleed it after. You don't have to touch any of that. So we're just getting it ready to start testing here. I just marked the cam. It's a little bit hard to see. There is a dot on that cam. And it's supposed to be flush with the top of your cylinder head there. The exhaust side is a little bit harder to see. There is a mark on that one as well. I just marked it with a little bit of Sharpie because it's really hard to see in there. But that one's supposed to be flush with the valve cover as well. And of course it's right behind the frame, so you really can't see in there that well. And then this is the cam, or the crank marking. And that's supposed to be flush with this little mark on the case there. So that's how the timing looks. It's not bad, like the intake cam you can see really clearly. That exhaust side is stubborn though. Yeah. So this is just some really good information I found right from the service manual. As you can see the top right corner there, that's your cylinder orientation. So number one is actually on the far left side on your clutch side of the bike. Here you can see the valve clearance cold specs in millimeters and thousandths of an inch. And then on the right, it shows you your timing marks, the K and the side of the case. And then the lower right picture is the cam timing marks on the valve cover. Easiest and quickest way to check the valve lash, use the T mark instead of the K. So rotate the engine 105 degrees. So now that the T mark is lined up with the side of the case, you can check the valve clearance on cylinder number one. You're going to know you're in the right spot when both cam lobes are facing a 45 degree angle on the intake and the exhaust side. The T mark is the easiest way to check your valve clearances because you can check the intake and the exhaust side at the same time. If you don't use this method, you can randomly check valves, but you're going to be jumping all over the place and it's not going to be very organized. So now you got your specs on cylinder number one, rotate the crank 270 degrees. And then you're gonna check your clearances on cylinder number three. T mark should be straight down. Once you're done with cylinder number three, rotate the crank another 180 degrees and measure cylinder number two. And then the last and final step, you're just gonna go 90 degrees and check cylinder number four. And that is the quickest and easiest way to check all your valve clearances. It's not the best drawing here, but I'll run you up to speed on the numbers I got. So these are my cylinders, one, two, three, four. These are my specs. Exhaust valves are between eight thou and 10 thou. Intake 0.4 and 0.8. So coming over here, all my exhaust valves were bang on. My intake valves, they were pretty good. I had two that were five thou. So they're getting pretty close to that four thou clearance spec but they're all still in spec. And the only downside is if I wanted more valve clearance, so five is a lower number, that's a tight, tighter clearance than six. If I wanted more valve clearance, I'd have to go with a smaller shim. And the next smaller shim is roughly two thou. So then it would bring my fives up to seven thou and I'd be borderline in spec on the loose side. So I don't really think I'd be any farther ahead. It is a lot more work to adjust the valves 
rather than just check them. So I think I'm going to leave it. Uh, this isn't where my issue is. So let's put it all back together. A lot of work just to check valves, but at least I know they're all in spec. They're all good. No noticeable wear. They're all pretty same cylinder to cylinder. So it is what it is. Another thing that's really common on these bikes is the timing chain tensioner, this guy here. So a lot of guys swap these out to a manual chain tensioner, but that comes with its pros and cons like anything. So this factory tensioner is oil fed. So it'll supply the same amount of tension on your chain, no matter how much wear, no matter how much slack your chain has, it'll have the proper amount of tension at all times. You don't have to touch it, but on the downside, if this fails, uh, you could potentially damage your engine. If your time and chain skips a tooth, your valves could touch pistons, uh, it's just bad. So that's why a lot of guys swap these out, take the, the failed component out of the equation. So if you swap this out to a manual or a mechanical adjustment, it's a little bit harder to set up and you have to keep an eye on your tension because it's not automatic, it's not oil fed like this one. So it doesn't fail in the same way as these, but periodically you will have to check it because as you get wear, uh, it won't adjust your chain tension for you. Now it's gonna take a long time for these chains to actually start showing wear and stretch, but it is just something to keep in mind if you do go the manual tensioner route, it is a good idea to check it periodically. All right, bikes back together. I was just doing some finishing touches. I took off the rear passenger pegs. It gives it a nice clean look. And when I had the battery out and everything, uh, I found this starter solenoid, or what I think is a starter solenoid anyways. And I had some corrosion in on the terminals. I've already cleaned it up as best I can, but I'm almost thinking this might be the issue I'm having right now with the cold starts. So I definitely got a lot of corrosion out of there. Haven't got everything. I'm gonna put some dialectic grease in there and see if it's any better. But I think I might have to replace this. If it was just this causing my issues, that'd be sweet. But if it's not this, it might be starter or something along those lines as well. This would be a lot easier to change than the starter, so. So I finished the bike late last night and it did start really easy, my first attempt. Like it didn't even crank. I would say it was running in a second or two. So that was a good sign, but I didn't adjust any of the valves or anything. This is more or less a test for that starter solenoid that I cleaned the corrosion out of. So it's been sitting all night again. It's, it was minus five overnight. It's about plus five in the shop here. So this is in the shop. It looks like plus six maybe. Yeah, it's pretty high on the wall there, but plus six. So plus five, plus six. You don't really ride in much colder than that. So this will be a really good indication on if that starter solenoid and that little bit of corrosion cleaning helped. So I put a little bit of dielectric grease in there too. And dielectric grease is basically just an insulator to help with preventing corrosion in the future. So let's start it up and see if it's any better. Moment of truth. Pretty good. I let off the starter there because I thought it started. I think it's fixed. It's never started that easy. days of working on this damn thing if you guys are having cold start issues i would say start with your battery make sure that's good and if your battery is good go straight to that solenoid don't mess around i was kind of thrown for a loop because this one was backfiring pretty good and it backfired through the intake and i'm kind of new to the cross plane world so i thought it was a little bit lacking on bottom end power, but I think that's just kind of how these bikes are. So I went straight 
to a valve set because it's almost time with 30,000 K on the bike. Like this one has 26, never been touched, but like you guys saw, all those valves were bang on. Uh, it was pretty much a waste of time. So start with your basics, even if it is kind of funny, giving you some funny issues like backfiring and mine backfired through the intake too. So I thought valve flash for sure, but learn from my mistakes. These are pretty stout engines and they're pretty hard to hurt. So yeah, start with everything else attached to the engine. Battery, starter, starter solenoid. Yeah, just, just go the easiest route possible. So now that I'm getting all the kinks worked out of the bike, I'm finally gonna get some better footage, some more riding, uh, some more seat time. And I'm gonna compare the new cross plane to my old flat plane 06. Cause there's definitely some things I like about each bike and there's things I don't like about each bike. So after I get some more seat time and really get a good feel for this R1, I will leave an honest review on both and get some good footage of the bikes in action. So that should be a lot more fun than wrenching on them. Cheers guys. Thanks for watching. Like always, catch you in the next one.